I myself have asked my JW family members certain questions, which to me are very basic questions. I'm not asking deep theoretical questions like about ancient Israel or whatever. I'm asking basic doctrinal questions. And they're like, wow, we haven't thought about that. And I'm kind of asking myself, like, you've been a witness for 30, 40, 50 years. You haven't asked these questions, you know, and I've only been alive for 20 some odd years. <laughs> so, so to me, I'm like, that's the power of, a, of an education, especially a liberal arts education. Hi, I'm Lady C. Hi, I'm JT. And welcome to another episode of The Critical Thought. In this episode, we will be discussing with an unbaptized publisher what it was like growing up with parents who are Jehovah's Witnesses. You're listening to The Critical Thought, where we challenge our listeners to use critical thinking when examining the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, uh, Chris is going to share with us his personal experience uh, as an unbaptized publisher, and we're going to help everybody to see exactly the impact that this religion has on persons who are unbaptized publishers. Chris and I share something uh, very much in common. You see, Chris is from New York City. In fact, The Kingdom Hall that Chris attended was the exact same one I attended. So a lot of the people that was in the Kingdom Halls, well, we were familiar with uh, his family and everything. So we have this little commonality and we wanted to share his experience with you today. Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm happy to be featured on the XJW Critical Thinker channel. Thank you so much, JT and Lady C for having me on. Well, Chris, we are so happy that you had the opportunity to um, join us today in the discussion about your life as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and what it was like, you know, growing up in the religion and also being able to leave this religion without any difficulties. So you want to let us know how you got involved with the religion? Yes. So I was actually born into the religion. Um, Both my parents were... But at the time when I was born, they were both Jehovah's Witnesses. So I essentially, yep, I never had the experience of having to, you know, find the witnesses or seek the witnesses out myself. It was something that from, I guess, my earliest moment of consciousness, I remember, you know, doing Jehovah's Witness routines. So knocking on doors, um, not being able to sit in the room when there's birthday parties happening. Um Anything that's that's alluded to Jehovah's Witness and their practices, I did it from a very early age. Yeah, it was all you knew growing up. Um, And the impact is, is, like you said, is is amazing because we simply did it at rote. That's how we did it. Now, Chris, are you the only child? I am the only child, yes. So your friends basically, like many of us, we had our siblings to play with. So your friends basically was pretty much contained to basically just witness kids? Yes, and then that's actually an interesting uh, question because growing up, and so I was in two congregations, so originally the congregation that you and I first attended, another congregation located elsewhere in the neighborhood that I'm from, um, and both congregations, there were not a large, there wasn't a large population of children. And that was always an issue growing up because um, for whatever odd reason, I guess we can talk about later on, most congregations were primarily middle age. It's a lot of elderly people in these congregations. But when it came to like um, young ones, it wasn't that large. I think growing up, there was only about four children in the congregation that uh, in my particular congregation. So that made it really interesting, which I think leads to you know, another phenomenon later on in my life of having a lot of friends who were not witnesses because there really was not a large pool of young people in the congregations that I attended. Yeah, and many congregations around the world, that, that's a problem. And so you oftentimes will have young people who literally they end up having to befriend some older person many times. Uh, so they don't have the, the, that camaraderie with other young people to do things with. And of course, people outside the congregation uh, you can't have anything to do with it because they're worldly. So you have this very small world that you as a witness actually end, end up growing up in many times. Yeah, I can relate to what you went to because my dad was military. And because there were no witnesses on face, we were isolated. And thank goodness my mother, she let us hang around the neighborhood kids. Yeah. So I can relate to what you're saying. <laughs> How were your parents, though? Uh, were they very, very active in the congregation, pioneering elders, ministerial service? Or, or how, how was it when you was growing up? 
Um, definitely. Yes. So um, growing up when I was born, my father wasn't an elder, but I believe when I was about three, four years old, my father was appointed as an elder. Um, and that definitely helped me to see the hierarchy of the witnesses, you know, having a father who was an elder and in seeing the, as you can say, the patriarchy of the witnesses of how a status of a woman is then tied to what is her husband or spouse doing in the congregation. Um, so I would even say for me, I, I remember there was definitely like this certain um, requirement of how, you know, be in field service and, you know, comport yourself in a very particular way because you have a father who is an elder in a congregation. Yeah, as known as the elder's kids syndrome, pastor's yeah. kids, uh, you have a certain standard that, that you have to live up to. And sometimes it's just unrealistic and, 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 it's, and can it can be very much a lot of pressure for kids whose parents, especially the fathers and elders, because, you know, everybody's looking at us and see what we're doing and all that kind of stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's a problem. How did it affect you? Was, was your father really strict with you in those, in those keeping with those regulations? Uh, definitely. So um, definitely growing up, there definitely was a strictness about um, going in field service, placing a certain amount of magazines, always being in field service, studying my watchtower, studying my awake, and then studying whatever book at the time that, the witnesses were studying for book study. So there definitely wasn't room to I guess, be a witness that was missing meetings. Um, def so yes, yeah, so the religion was definitely instilled on that essence. Um, but I was also privileged in the sense of having a mother who um, definitely, I would say, didn't drink the Kool-Aid all the way um, and, and let and allowed room. So kind of what you were saying, Lady C, um, my being able to have friends who weren't witnesses was very much so facilitated by my mom, understanding that there was a grave lack of young people in my congregation. And for any for the development of any healthy young person, you have to interact with people your age. You know, all your friends can't be, you know, older individuals. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you need some people your age to be, you know, healthily developed as a as a young person. Yeah. How how did you do in terms of like your um your relatives? Um, were your relatives witnesses or were they not witnesses? And therefore it creates a, a interesting dynamic during holidays and, you know, just your cousins and all that kind of stuff. Uh, definitely. So um, my grandparents on my mom's side were witnesses on my father's side, just my grandmother was a witness um, and aunts witnesses as well. But I definitely had extended family who weren't witnesses. So going to family reunions, definitely we were like the witness family. Um, or definitely, you know, going to, on both sides, going to different family functions. And we were definitely the witness family. Um, but what's interesting is that they were very, they might not have agreed with the religious beliefs, but they were very open. Like, okay, you're witnesses, but we still love you, you know, um, versus what you hear often in the, the XJW world where, you know, witnesses don't look favorably, favorably upon people who are not witnesses. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that the family, they, they love you regardless of whether you go to church every Sunday or, or don't go in 20 years. They they just have family love. Mm -hmm. the, the, natu the, na the natural affection is, is really what that really is. Yeah. So how did things progress for you? Um, and what age were you when you stopped attending meetings at the Kingdom Hall? Okay, yeah. So how things progressed for me, um, regular life as a witness, going up through elementary school, then into middle school. And it's actually interesting when I became an unbaptized publisher, it was very much so because the people in my congregation were doing it. So the people in my age who were making a decision to become an unbaptized publisher, I'm going to be very honest. I didn't know why exactly I was doing it. It just felt like the right thing to do. And then even in the, um, I guess, witness hierarchy. No one really even asked me, why are you doing this? It was just, Oh, perfect. You want to become an unbaptist publisher? You know, sign on up, you know, almost like, um, almost like a, a, a military, you know, enlistment officer, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. Not, 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 asking, <laughs> not asking any second questions, just sign on up. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so that was definitely my experience. So I was like, Oh, okay. Now I'm baptized publisher. Um, so in the answer to your question, um, I left, I, so I guess I like to pinpoint my questioning phase because it definitely wasn't just a clean break. Um, my parents got divorced and in that divorce, you know, this, um, the person who was very heavy with the witness ideology, um, really pretty much kind of phased out my life at that point, which would be my father. So it allowed me time to not always be bombarded by witness propaganda. 
um, which allowed me to then realize that, wow, there's other ways of thought. So this is around middle school, um, given the timestamp. Um, and I'm thinking about, wow, there's other religions, you know, um, you know, growing up in a big city, you're going to run into all different ways of thinking. You realize that, wow, the witnesses aren't the only one with a monopoly on religion. And they're not the only religion that has some ideas that make sense. A lot of religions have ideas that make sense outside just of the witnesses. Um, so that's when that started to happen. And then I guess I found out recently, I didn't, there wasn't a name to it, but I was Pimo, <laughs> you know, physically and mentally out around going into high school. Um, really, and then, you know, the witnesses would give a lot of talks talking about keep friends in the organization because those are the, the true, you know, they're within the, the truth and they're good friends. But a waking up point was being in high school and having friends who weren't witnesses. And I actually had really good, healthy friendships versus the people who were witnesses. You know, there was a lot of um, hypocrisy. There was, there was backstabbing. There was rumors being spread. All these things were happening right in, you know, supposedly Jehovah's True organization. So that also was another thinking moment where it's like, wow, you know, the witnesses, there, there are some flaws, which is fine. But on the, on the, on the Tuesday, Thursdays and Sundays, that's when the talks are being given, they're not admitting that the religion has flaws. Um, so I feel like if they were more honest about that, I could kind of be like, okay, you know, I, you're, you're admitting that your religion has some faults in it. Um, then to go on to that, so I would say around ninth, 10th grade, I was, I really just decided that, hey, um, this is not for me. Um, I have no, this, I see no reason in knocking on doors. I'm at this time, I'm not even doing my watchtower. I'm not even doing my book study books anymore. Um, and really it wasn't because what's interesting for me is that the witnesses try to make it seem like that when you stop going, it's because you want to start doing drugs. You want to start having sex out of marriage. For me, it just really was that I I've always loved books, you know, hence why I'm in a PhD program right now. I love knowledge and I'm just, I'm on this search for knowledge and things just aren't adding up. And yeah. So. You said that you stopped attending meetings when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. At that time, was your mother still attending at the home? Um, yeah. So her and I are extremely close. And, and I'm also blessed to be, be able to have a mother that I could have this dialogue with. So it wasn't necessarily necessarily the fact that I'm having these questions and I'm keeping it to myself. I'm hiding it. You know, I was definitely able to have someone. We were always in constant dialogue where, you know, we will leave after our, you know, Thursday night, you know, uh, propaganda programming meeting. We would leave and I would say, did you hear what was said on the stage? Did that makes sense to you. And what's actually really interesting. This is also another wake up point for me was that this was around the time when Obama was running in 08. 09 around that time. And I just, I just remember all, of, you know, there was just this extra, you know, a lot of things are being said on the stage about, you know, the world's going to end and Obama can't change anything, you know, all this other stuff. And for me, a lot of it just really seemed like one, um, you know, like, okay, I, I, long story short, a lot of things just weren't making sense. And it just seemed like now that we now had a black president, we're in a predominantly black kingdom hall, but it seemed like the rhetoric got ramped up, especially when we got a black president. Um, so this, a lot of things start not making sense. So to answer your question, you know, I was able to have my mom to, to bounce these things off of. And to be quite honest, when I said, I don't really feel like going, we pretty much were on the same page about how this just isn't working for us anymore. Yeah. I, I do have a question. <clears throat> as you, as an adult, as you look back, do you think that the religion had an, because as witnesses, we brag about how we build families, make families stronger. Do you, as you look back, do you think that the religion and the demands of the religion perhaps may have impacted your own family? Um, I, I definitely think so. I think that the demands of the religion can definitely impact the family because in many ways, people are doing things for the religion and the religion has so many constraints and it makes people miserable. They're not living in their own personal truth. They're not doing what they want to do. So you're doing all these things. And I think... Even I realized this as a child when I felt like, wow, this religion is very constricting. I'm in ill service all the time. And then come to find out from talking to other family members, they themselves didn't always want to be in field service. You know, even they themselves were extremely tired from work and then having to go to a meeting to quite honestly, he keep hearing the same exact thing, you know, fear mongering, you know, <laughs> just the same old, same old. So I do think that unfortunately the, the same pressures and miserable feeling I had as a child, many adults feel and then it doesn't make a, co a healthy, cohesive family. We, we've heard other people 
who families split, that was really the cause. One person wasn't keeping up to what was perceived you should be, because remember in the organization, you're either spiritually weak or you're spiritually strong. And so we yeah. categorize people real quick. And, and even husband and wives can categorize, can categorize each other as well. And it don't, it don't help at all in marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Now with your parents divorcing and with you being at a, such a young age, how did that affect your grades in school? Yeah, so it's actually interesting to be quite honest. My grades went up after the divorce, um, and then it's also some there's some dynamics that aren't all witness related, you know. Um, but part of the reason, because I even remember being in middle school, and that middle school was pretty challenging, and going to trying to having a, several hours of homework every single night, and then trying to then run to the meetings. Um, at the time there was a meeting like two days during the week and there was a Sunday meeting. Um, so that definitely took away time from my homework. So I literally remember coming home from the meeting and trying to wrap up my homework as in particular math. I was never really good at math. So I'm up late after the meeting, trying to wrap this up, get to bed early, whatever. Um, so when, uh, after my parents' divorce happened and then this the stressors of trying to be this perfect witness that really loves Jehovah and, and looks prim and proper, that stress being lifted off my shoulders, actually my grades start going up, which is a really interesting um, you know, correlation. Excellent. So then at that point, you, you and I had spoken um, earlier about some of your accomplishments you know, and at what point did you realize that you were going to be going to college and how did you make it happen financially and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going to college, I have uh, much of it. I have um, to give you know, a, a big shout out to my mom, because once again, she was on board for that. Like we've had several conversations and she even admitted that the, the beauty in, you know, going to a college, going to a historically black college. And she also understood that that was something that was not really compatible with the witness ideology, because even though members now might not admit that they're very anti higher education, anti, um, you know, intellectualism, very anti intellectual religion. Um, but that was definitely understood going to the halls. I, I, I even remember being at circuit assemblies and I remember they would have, um, people on the stage saying that they got a full ride to Yale and they with they didn't take the, the full ride. They became a full pioneer and everyone was just clapping like drones, just clapping, clapping. It was almost reminiscent of like a, um, a Nazi Germany, like Hitler rally, you know, where everyone's just clapping. It's like, what do you, do you really hear where you're clapping at? You know? Um, and then I remember being young, remembering that. So the answer to your question um, for me is I, I always, I kind of knew I wanted to go to college even before stop going to the hall, I was trying to figure out how am I going to make this work? You know, I, I remember growing up, I wanted to be an investment banker. I wanted to be a lawyer, but it was always, how are you going to do that and serve Jehovah? Like, that was always the question, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was, it was always crazy, you know, this question of how can you serve Jehovah and do this? So now knowing that I'm not going to the hall anymore, I realized that I could live the truth that I wanted to live. That I can be the profession that I wanted to be someone who loves history. Um, and travel the world and conduct research without having the pressure of having to, not even in a matter of loving God, but a matter of serving this organization and their prescribed rules. Um, so that really happened in high school when I kind of realized like, I'm going to go away to school. And I think you asked me about paying for it. Um, so I, re I remember um, in high school, they, that's when they start having seminars about paying for college you know, um, doing these different things about financial aid, whatever. Fortunately, because of not being a witness and having to go to the meetings and stuff, I was involved in different community organizations like the YMCA, who they had several robust scholarships. Um, I also, because of my grades going up, because I could really focus on school, I also had a high enough GPA and SAT score, ACT score, to earn a um, in-school scholarship as well. Um, and these are things, I, I mean, I've also heard stories of people who had good grades who were witnesses, but for me, not being, not having to go to the hall and just really fully dedicate myself to school, allow me to earn both external and internal aid for a school. So what kind of advice would you give to young people that's listening to this video right now? Uh, wow. Several things. Um, well, first, I mean, I know it's tricky because I know everyone doesn't have a parent that will listen to them. And I, I also thinking back to my time in the hall, 
uh, in the witnesses, it, the definitely like they always stress, you know, the parents, you have to instill a love for Jehovah. So in other words, if we're going to decode that the parents, you are the ones that keep your children from being free individual thinkers, you know? So definitely I was a, you know, the mold kind of broke with me where I didn't have a parent to just keep reinforcing, you know, the high control group propaganda. Um, but I, I would say the young people where it's like, you know, live the life that you want to live. Um, you know, go after your dreams and passions. You know, there's definitely more to life than just knocking on doors and then doing a, taking a role in the, in a career that you can only, they can only benefit Washington track society, you know? Um, so that's the first thing that I would say. And I'll also say there's so much information out there in this world. You know, there's vast, there's libraries all over the world. There's libraries all over the U.S. Um, well-kept libraries that have a vast amount of information. Um, and I would say, don't just limit yourself to the JW um, archives, because as even we know, they're even limiting access to their older materials, which is also very disingenuous because the whole point of a library is to ha- offer you access to out of date books, print texts that you can't get your ax hands on. So I think it's disingenuous that they're limiting the act, the books that they can get their hands on. So I would say, you know, take advantage of other forms of knowing, you know, other scholars. Um, because what's funny to me is that, you know, the witnesses talk about the beauty of Jehovah, but I mean, I think that's the beauty of Jehovah. If you want to think of it that way, that he allowed people to have these different ideas. You know, life wouldn't be beautiful if we were only constricted to one particular idea. Um, so those are two things I can't think of the top of my head. I mean, unfortunately, you know, for my case, I was very privileged to be able to have the leeway. I've heard of so many other people who they didn't have that wiggle room to kind of break the mold of JW um, thinking. Yeah, because we've heard of individuals that were pulled out of um, school to be homeschooled when mm. the parents found out that they wanted to pursue um, you know, higher education or mm. their, their academics were so, so good that, you know, the teachers were like pushing them to go to college or getting scholarships. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty warped. The mindset is pretty warped in the organization. Yeah, it is. And I think to be quite honest with you, I really do think um, being a part of the XJW community, I've heard people argue that a lot of JW practices are a human rights violation. And I would say, I mean, this may seem like a stretch, but in many ways, the practices of the JWs, I would say child abuse might be too harsh, but it definitely isn't abuse. It's it's abusive to a degree. You know, it's abusive having to, on a Saturday, I know for myself, when I wanted to participate in Little League Baseball, I have to get dressed and knock on doors in the ghetto. Um, You know, it's it's just, it's not something that a young child should have to really experience, you know. Um, even like birthday parties, you know, we love camaraderie, you know, to not be able to be with people your age and participate in the birthday party, eating a cupcake or something, because I don't know how the witnesses justify it because some scripture in the Bible said birthdays are bad. Um, so, I mean, I, I personally do think that we need to get to the root of this. We need to really get to the root that um, these practices are really harming and in many cases ruining people's childhoods, you know, and I don't think that, um, the U S government or anybody, whoever is really aware of what is really going on within this organization because it's so insular. Yeah. It's a, it's a very, it's a closed society as it were. Um, that's why they used to refer to it as the new world society, a new world order and things like that. Um, and so as a result, it keeps people basically in the lockdown. Uh, you made a very good point about how one of the things that makes the organization so effective is everything in your life everything in your life will always be couched in a certain context. You either love God if you do this or you don't love God if you do that. Mm -hmm. And when those are the choices that are laid out, like you said, you know, how how will you go to school and be a doctor if you love Jehovah, you know, and and, and crazy stuff like that. And so that's only the two options you're always given. Everything is given in a black and white because it's very easy to control people when you keep it simple. Choose yeah. this or choose that. But when you give people variety and people are like, whoa, let me just think about it. You, you don't want people thinking. <laughs> people don't want you thinking about it. We want you just to take one or the other. And so after you choose one direction or the other, you will then be uh, punished for it. Or you will be, re- like you said, 
a person chooses not to go to college. We set them up on a platform, 10, 15, 20,000 people, Yankee Stadium. Someone decides to go to college, we speak nothing of them. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be one of the most difficult things when you think about it and you talk to, to people, especially in the African-American community. The African-American community has always understood the importance and the value of education because it opens doors. Definitely. Um, it opens doors. E even if there is racism, whatever, it will open. As I tell you all the time, if you think you have no doors open without no education as a black person, then try it. And so you can see that the difference in, 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 in what happens to people. And that's where um, our own personal experience also comes into play. Um, I was in Harlem. You were in Harlem. Um, you know, and I agree with you. You're taking, and when I was there, and, 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 and it, was, it was basically a tough neighborhood. But when Definitely, you look yeah. back now, it's, it's almost unreal to think that we would have parents with four, five, and six-year-old kids going into buildings, crack vials, mm -hmm. drug dealers standing on the stoop. What you know, what you want here, man. You know, I remember those days. And so we had little kids, four and five-year-old kids. And if you ask the average parent, would they take their child to the environment like that for some volunteer? Like, no. Mm -mm. And so um the the yeah. we often, you know, we often laugh how how more witnesses didn't get bit by dogs and shot by folks at doors when you mm. can see the places that we went thinking and believing, you know, God is protecting us. We was out there yeah. hawking books. And um, and so now when you look back, you know, it, it, it is really amazing as you look back. You mentioned that you were in college. Yes. Um, and you mentioned that right now you're in your PhD program. Um, what is that like for you coming from a background where you were basically told not to go to school, mm -hmm. never celebrated your intelligence or whatever. And now here you are uh, about ready to do your, 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 your PhD and your dissertation and so forth. Definitely. So what's interesting is I remember leaving for Howard University in 2013 and then coming back to Harlem and then running into current witnesses between 2013, 2017. And the question always was, I mean, I, I didn't have the beard. So the beard is the obvious signifier that I'm no longer a witness. But at the time, you know, no beard. So they didn't I guess they didn't really know, OK, are you still a witness or you're not a witness? We don't see you at the meetings. So it was always what are you doing for yourself? Now, Chris, what, how, what are you doing for yourself? And it was always kind of like, you know, you know, we're expecting you to be cracked out somewhere, you know, but it, it wasn't the question wasn't coming from a place of we know you're doing great in life. It was like we're, we're waiting to hear the negative. And I'll tell them, oh, I'm at Howard University. And then some some of the uh, witnesses would ask, are you commuting? And, you know, Howard University uh, is in Washington, D.C., which is four hours away from New York. So no, I'm not commuting four hours every single day to <laughs> to, to campus. I, I live out there, and the conversation was always would always stop. Oh, you know. Um, so that was interesting. You know, running into witnesses because, as you know, it's a very small world. Um, yes. And African American community is even smaller. Um, so running into them often, and the question that was always a question. Um, even running into young people who they were my friends when I was there. And I even remember exchanging numbers with them. Hey, you know, hey man, let's keep in contact. Wouldn't hear anything. Um, uh, would even reach out or anything. It's even happened recently. A friend of mine um ran into his mom and she was actually very happy to see me. She's a current witness. And she said, We're gonna exchange numbers and I'll give, you know, my son a number. Never even heard of him from him. Which is fine. You know, I think everything happens for a reason, but I do think a lot of it is this this um belief system that, you know, okay, he's away at college. And there's this idea that the bo only debauchery happens at college. Um, and if I could just, if I could just say really quickly, being an undergrad, not even being in a PhD program, but just being in a basic four year university, you know, you take classes where you're taught to critically reason. I think that's one of the beauties of a liberal arts education, where is that it isn't, it isn't, they don't really try to tell you how to think, but this is how you reason. This is how you ask questions which goes directly against what the witnesses have going on about asking questions. Because even my, I myself have asked my JW family members certain questions, which to me are very basic questions. I'm not asking deep theoretical questions like about ancient Israel or whatever. I'm asking basic, you know, doctrinal questions. And they're like, wow, we haven't thought about that. And I'm kind of asking myself, like, you've been a witness for 30, 40, 50 years. You haven't asked these questions, you know, and I've only been alive for 20 some odd years. <laughs> so, so to me, I'm like, that's the power of, a, of an education, especially a liberal arts education. Um, so that's been my experience. And then um, going away, going away from my Ph.D., I haven't really had many interactions with um, witnesses or or any, anything of that sort. But it's just been beautiful continuing, you know, my pursuit of knowledge. 
um, traveling to other parts of the world. A lot of my travels have actually brought me um, to, um, to Caribbean countries. And what's interesting in, in those Caribbean countries, there's kingdom halls all over the place. And it's sad to say because, you know, some of these Caribbean countries are like a lot of African-American communities, impoverished. And I think the witnesses have even staked their claim. You know, so and it's not even just JW, you know, there's there's churches everywhere. I mean, it's funny seeing the global impact of poverty the same way in Harlem. There's a church on every corner and a lot of these Caribbean countries at the end of every single row, there's a church. And you can bet to believe there's a kingdom hall there. And I think the society knows that these people are impoverished, looking for answers. Um, and, you know, West Indian people, like African-American people in many ways, are very spiritual. So if you break down Jesus or whatever to them, they'll latch on to it, you know. Yeah, it's very true. Um, because of technology and everything, you're starting to ask questions and you have the ability to actually find the answers now. Years yeah. ago, when people back in the, you know, the 60s and 70s, like when my parents became a witness and my wife's parents became a witness, there was nothing to dig into. But today, uh, information boys at your fingertips. Yeah, I really like the fact that Chris mentioned that there's libraries everywhere, well-kept libraries that has information. Because I'd like to say for people who can't get to college or anything like that, you know, knowledge is not always found in a classroom. Mm -hmm. You can get knowledge, like he said, at the library. You can get access to the library on the Internet. If you go to your local library and you have a library card, you can get access to digital books, audio books, everything. So I would definitely recommend, you know, people who are watching the video to look into, you know, just learning on their own if they, if they have to. Yeah. I think one of the most important things is because there, there are actually going to be Jehovah's Witnesses who are watching this video. We know okay. the comments. Um, is The issue of college is not whether everybody should go to college. The issue is, do you have the choice? Mm -hmm. Do you have the choice without being condemned as somebody who doesn't love God? And this is something that is really, um, it's really something you find in the high control groups. Uh, other churches, they establish colleges because they understand the value of education. They, they set their own college. Um, the witnesses don't. We created this little thing years ago called the Theocratic Ministry School, and we thought we were getting PhDs from that, as it were. Um, we have little elder school, little pioneer school. These are not, they're not nothing like that. And so we walked around thinking that we had been educated. And we, all we did was review Watchtower Magazine. We already studied. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ability to think, that is the biggest thing that we find as a witness that we were disadvantaged of. We were not allowed to use our thinking abilities. And so now, as you say yourself, and even, uh, you know, even though you were not baptized, and there's a lot of people who are not baptized. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people to understand that whole idea of being baptized means nothing. It means nothing in terms of watchtower because unbaptized people, and we have met them, we've talked to them, you know it. These individuals may have never gotten baptized, but they carry the beliefs of this religion. Yep. People not baptized grow up, don't go to any kingdom hall, they get married, they have children, their child is in an accident, and all of a sudden, we can't take that fraction. That's the wrong one. We can't take that fraction. And the wife or the husband, like, what are you talking about? Because these things stay with us. I, I, I look at my own family. My sister was never baptized, um, but she raised her kids as if they were Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. because that's all she knew. Uh, we see people come back on our channel and they'll say, no, I never got baptized. But the fact that you're here on the channel, the fact that something in your mind says, let me type in Jehovah's Witness or let me click on this Jehovah's Witness link. It's because you were impacted by the things we were taught. And I'll tell you what the kicker is. It's a cool trick the society plays, the coolest trick in the world. Is it not ironic that the society will count you in their numbers? Wow. As unbaptized, when they go to the press or they want to tell someone, you know, we have 8 million individuals out fasting, preaching the good news. Yeah. Get in trouble. What's the first thing a Jehovah's Witness asks you when you say so-and-so got in trouble? Was he baptized? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you get disowned. But we're going to use you to count these numbers and make us look good. And yeah. so this is how an organization demonstrates. Just want to say this real quick. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we used to ask, I always ask this question. 
How many people are baptized? Of that 8 million, that 8 million number, how many are baptized and how many are not? Mm. I have never seen in print that number. And the society has to count. Because on your publisher record card, it asks how old you are. It asks whether you are baptized or not. And on the old card, it used to ask whether you are the anointed or not. So wow. now that they've gone digital, now they're going digital for most things. The society can easily access to find out how many people are baptized and how many are not, but they don't tell you. They don't tell you. And so um, it, it's, it's important, like people like yourself, share your story. It, it, it is the most important thing that we find that people must hear to see how the organization impacts people. And then, of course, to see how people are able to leave and use their life in a way that benefits themselves and others. You know. Thank you. And if oh, oh yeah, and if I could just add on to what you were saying, JT, I mean, it's so real because and it wasn't until you guys really said this, I didn't really think of it like that. Like, wow, like, you know, I was unbaptized because in my head, you know, because I was raised in the in the organization from a very young age, I've always considered myself, you know, a witness. And it almost felt like I was baptized, you know, and this the damage is done. I mean, it's definitely like you say in your other videos, psychological abuse, it's spiritual abuse, you know, it's emotional abuse. And you don't even have to, you know, be dunked in the water for all that to take place. You know, you, that, that can never happen. But you're every meeting you're bombarded with. You're not doing enough. You know, sh I, I even remember on my way out years later, um, they were showing people the witnesses were literally praising people, children who were getting baptized at five, six, seven years old. You know, so here I am sitting there 12, 13 years old on the fence and you start to get the feeling that, OK, maybe this is what I need to do, because they're telling me on the stage that this person loves God or they're closer to God because they're getting baptized as five, six years old. Um, and, and you really start to feel it, you know, and to be quite honest, the witnesses in many ways, it makes you socially awkward because you're not able to just do natural developmental things that children need to do. You know, um, you spend all your, if you're spending most of your time with this religion, knocking on doors, you know, these are the things that, you know, you want to be able to do. Like just for me, it was really playing sports. And I feel like playing sports is a really good socialization tool. And I, I spent pretty much my high school years trying to catch up on all those years I wasn't allowed playing, you know, sports or other, you know, team sports, really. So I just really wanted to just kind of say that you're completely right that, um, you know, is the witnesses dig, they dig really deep when you're born in. And I often tell my grandparents because they converted as adults that it's a completely lived experience that they will have no idea of versus converting in versus being born in. And I, I don't think that gets stressed enough. That is so true. When you were in college as an undergrad student, how did you fit in with your mm -hmm. fellow classmates? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I think that Fortunately, I kind of had a head start because I had stopped going to the hall around ninth grade, 10th grade. Um, it had given me time to, you know, shed the witness programming, you know, break out of like the cult mindset, cult thinking. So I would say, fortunately, by the time I got to college, I was, you know, um, kind of like breaking off the mold and, you know, getting normal again. <laughs> so but I think definitely a lot of it was still the remnants of it were still kind of there because um, I remember my freshman year of college there was like this uh, international convention and, you know, I, my mom and I still went cause my family went, um, whatever. Um, so it, there still was kind of like this, okay, it may be the truth. So I'll still go. Um, but when it comes to like socially speaking, um, I personally don't think I really had too much of a hard time. Thanks to not stopping going to the hall around ninth, 10th grade. Now I feel like if I would have stopped in 12th grade, it might be a little bit different, but um, I had a peer who was in college with me and he actually was a Jehovah's Witness and he was kind of trying to make it work. So we lived in the same dorm. Um, and I remember seeing tracks and stuff in his room. I remember seeing him leave for the meetings and leave for field service. So I remember it's actually funny because we lived on the same floor and I remember like, wow, you know, this is like a mirror because here I am. I'm just doing my own thing in college as a, a former witness. And here he is in college trying to make it work um, for whatever reason. So that was an interesting, you know, experience my freshman year. What happened to him? So I believe um, he dropped out. Um, so he uh, he definitely I think he dropped out of, of undergrad. Um, 
I, it's sad to say, I think he went like the route that the witnesses like, you know, so witnesses that would definitely be, you know, a poster child. So, you know, engaging in drinking, smoking, um, not doing well academically. So he kind of went that route where if the witnesses were ever get their hands on his story, then that would definitely be like the poster child. Like, look, he went away to school. This is what happened to him. Um, but what I do think a lot of it is, and I don't, I really, I think the key factor here is that um, it's a lot of, it's a lot psycho-emotionally trying to live that double life. So if you can just live the life you want to live and just be like, hey, you know what? That religion isn't for me. I think your spirit is a lot more ease. But when you have the burden of Western track society on top of you, I think that leads to things like drinking and smoking. You know, so if you let people just, you know, admit that this isn't for them, I think it, it alleviates a lot of that, you know, stress that would send somebody down that path. Right. Or like for you, like you said, when you were in high school, you weren't trying to be a witness and also be at school and be in the outcast because the kid who can't do different things, you know, because of the religion, but you're able to just be a normal child. So when you get ready to go off to college, you're not trying to, you know, like make up for lost time. Exactly. See, when he was in college, nobody could see what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So now he's making up for lost time. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's exactly what was pretty much going on. Um, but what's interesting about being at college was uh, um, I was also in a lot of my friends or a couple of my friends had similar backgrounds when it came to religion. Um, so I think that was also the beauty of college is that I think um, going back to the witnesses about being a high control group, they want to limit your social interactions. So I'm meeting people from some are from New York, some are from across the country, and they were also in high control religious groups. You know, and we're able to share our stories. And then I think there's a key that you see that you're not alone. Um, I think that the thing about the witnesses is that they try their best to make you feel like you're alone. And I'm going to be quite honest with you. I definitely have felt like until I came across your channel, maybe it was at the start of quarantine about March 2020. I definitely felt like, OK, I'm not. I'm not going to be a witness and these are my reasons, but I'm definitely taking a, a, a shot in the dark. You know, it was definitely like, this is my gamble. Like, I, I always joke with my grandparents, like, you know what, like this is the gamble I'm taking, you know, if paradise does come, this is the, this is the decision I made, I chose to make, but now I'm really seeing like, okay, cool. I'm not alone. There's literally a whole community, tens, uh, hundreds of thousands of XJWs who are on the internet, have their sites and going to college. Also, it helped me to break that bubble even more, you know, well, that is so excellent. Just so your story is so, you know, in, encouraging for people listening. And you just sound like a person that's full of knowledge and, and you really thought this out. And it wasn't like you just woke up one day and just said, I'm out of here. Like you said, yeah. it was a, a, a gradual um, period of time that you got a chance to meet other people mm -hmm. and get a chance to, you know, figure out what it is you wanted to do with your life. You know, so I'm just really happy to hear your story because I remember years ago this story that was related to me about going to college mm -hmm. and the whole idea of going off to college as well as getting an education would be what you just got through saying meeting people from other walks of life mm -hmm. because if somebody's from the north somebody from the south somebody's from out west whatever you bring all these people together and they're able to, to, you know, show different, show people how they live differently. Uh -huh. And it's not like right or wrong or anything like that, but it's just showing people that people over here live like this, people over here live, live like that. Like you said, the Caribbean, uh -huh. and you were able to see, you know, different things and how people lived. So college, you know, gives you a well-rounded view of, um, and that's if you let it, that's if you get the experience yeah. of you know, like meeting people that are from different places, you know? Yeah. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to make? Um, wow, well, Sean, I think. <laughs> well, first I, I would really say, you know, thank you for having me on your channel. Um, really because um, I've always felt like, you know, um, the way the witnesses function and the way many people, or the way the, or the, way the witnesses try to make XJWs, you know, the whole term apostate, I always felt like, you know, my story would never get heard you know, people wouldn't listen to it. And that's why I'm happy that you say that current witnesses listen to your channel because of, you know, going to the hall, you know, everyone's so 
you know, oh, this is a positive literature, you know, don't listen to it, you know, and because I've, I grew up thinking that, wow, okay, you know, I'm kind of like a, a rogue, you know, lone wolf in my ideology. I'm just very happy that, you know, your channel is around so people can see that there is a, another community or there's a whole community of people who are like, you know, we've been thinking the same exact thing about the witnesses. You know, we're on the same page. Yes, there is a lot of people who at this point in their lives, they're starting to uh, take a second look at things. And that's why we get a lot of witnesses on our site. And you can tell through the comments, but it doesn't matter. As I tell my wife all the time, the moment a Jehovah's Witness clicks on any of the links to any of these channels, game's over. Mm -hmm. Game's over. They've already the, they've already them put the first crack in the dike. All, all, it's already there. And they <laughs> yeah. can't patch it back up. They cannot patch it back yeah. up. In fact, every practically everyone you talk to, that is exactly the way they start. They can't, first of all, you ain't supposed to be here, right? Then they come out here, the first thing you try to do, you try to defend the organization. Every, everybody who's left does the same. It's a routine. You yeah. did it. Yeah. I mean, it's like <laughs> the, the same way you come into this organization is the same way you leave. That's true. And, it, it's, and that's just the way it is. And so that's why I tell witnesses who, former witnesses who have websites, don't get upset. Be thankful. Be thankful. Yeah. Be happy that they're here. Because when that witness is willing to set up an account and start posting back, the game's over. Because yeah. I was always taught, you do not have nothing to do with them. You have no interest in what they're doing, what they're talking about. It means nothing to you. And that is what it is supposed to be, as they used to tell us at Bethel, if you are happy and content with Jehovah's provisions, you have no interest in what formal witnesses have to do. Man, they up here all the time. They up here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say one other thing. This is more so, I guess, directed... Well, I guess people like myself who are dealing with, you know, um, the, the psycho spiritual abuse and people who are probably studying or thinking about studying, you know, before, you know, especially growing growing up in a neighborhood that has you know a lot of social social inequalities before you think about, you know, oh, yeah, you know, I want to get down with the witnesses. I think maybe ask yourself, you know okay, what about this religion is leading me to them or why am I entertaining them? And, you know, what's going on in my life that's making their message they're trying to peddle, you know, what's making it attractive? And I think, you know, JT, we even spoke about this a, a while ago, like in many cases, especially in impoverished neighborhoods, the people need therapy. You know, the, the people need real, you know, psycho-emotional healing and counseling. What they don't need is, you know, the, the teachings of the Jehovah's Witness organization. I think that um, for former witnesses and people who are thinking about joining the witnesses, you know, we all need some form of counseling, you know, mental health services, or, you know, just even just a, a, someone to talk to, you know, and think through our problems. And what we don't need is, you know, the rigid formula that the witnesses offer as a solution to the world's problems. It's a good point. It's a very good point. Excellent point. And I wish I would have said this earlier, but I think, you know, going to school and learning about, um, you know, just gender, learning about sexuality, learning about, you know, evolutionary psychology, and then, you know, thinking about like natural human needs, you know, to reproduce and to demonize that, you know, and then to kick somebody out for that, I think is insane. But on top of that, too, you know, um, thinking about how uh, off the ratio is in the witnesses, you know, it's a really, it's a crazy, I don't know the exact numbers, but from my last read, like the P, the Pew research, it's something like, I think like 70% or 60 something percent of the witnesses are, are women, which is a really crazy ratio. And then what I think it, what it leads the, what it leads to is, um, a lot of men who really aren't qualified for having things like an elder role or really important positions, they're, they're given these qualifications. And, and then I also have noticed too, is that if you take these same people and try to give them a real qualification in, you know, outside the witnesses, they can't even handle it, you know? So then when they're in the witness world, you know, they have these qualifications and then you have really qualified women, you know, chasing these men who in the real world, most women aren't even checking for them. You know, so it's it's a really crazy dynamic. And I think it's very detrimental. And I mean, as a young man, you know, I think if you're a man looking for a wife or whatever, you're having a hard time. The witnesses are a perfect situation for you. you you'll be you'll be your set. But as a woman, I think it's terrible, you know, especially in the African-American community. We're already the the numbers for women getting married are one to four. Only one in every four black women get married. So you you double that and the witnesses just makes it worse. You're right. And you know what? You made a good point about that ratio in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And when you think about it, in the world that we live in, 
it's more women that hold high level positions. And a lot, that's, that happens like in the African-American community. Yeah. There's right. more African-American women that hold higher jobs than African-American men. Yeah. And so it's very difficult being in this religion, knowing that you're a strong woman and you have to be with a man that doesn't have all that. Yeah. yeah. So you made a good point. And I think it also leads to the allure of, you know, if you're a man staying, because if I'm a man staying, you know, and let's just say, you know, outside the witnesses, um, I don't, I don't hold any real position. At least I had that in the, in the JWs, you know, so this, I can escape to this religion where it's extremely patriarchal. Um, I, I've been watching other videos where you hear about, you know, men getting in trouble for domestic violence or infidelity. And because it's the boys club, the elders kind of look out for them. You know, so, you know, so in this JW world, it's something as a man, especially you can kind of escape to it's boys club, it's patriarchy, you know, and we can definitely put our, our foot on qualified women's necks, you know, and then because it's so insular, like, you know, in, in the, in the university or in the, in the corporate setting, there's an HR department that will handle it. And as we know, the, the society is not, they're not handling, they're not handling any of those things. <laughs> so like, that's where sit down, girl. Yeah, exactly. So if, if you're a man, you know, and and that's what you want, you're like, you can do all the what all the stuff you want, and society is gonna move very slowly handling it. Right. Like, where's the diversity program in the organization? Yeah, none of that. <laughs> the right. the roles of women in the organization. Um, I mean, and let me give you a let me give this is the best example I can think of. She's a circuit overseer's wife. Yep. You don't even know her name. Yeah. Her name is Helen, but you don't know her name is Helen. Because when you point to her, you say, you know, that's the circuit overseer's wife. You don't even give her the dignification, you don't even dignify her with her name. And that's because of the way the organization is structured. Well, you know, Chris, we enjoy the, the experiences and your life uh, experience in sharing with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. And the next time we see you, we'll be calling you Dr. Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for being on our program. This has been JT. And this has been Lady C. And this has been Chris. And we'll see you on the next video. This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers.